Hello, and welcome to Fresh Blood, a podcast about killing it in the age of ageism, where we prove that new blood does not necessarily equal young blood. I'll be your host, Jolie Downs. With over 20 years of executive recruiting experience, I've learned how much we need discussions around this issue. Thank you for joining us here on Fresh Blood. Today, we will be talking with Rita Barber. I'm going to let Rita introduce herself, but I wanted to share my experience the first time I had the pleasure of meeting Rita. I saw her give a speech about a topic that I didn't know about or really care about, but she immediately drew me in and made me care about everything that she had to say. She took me on a journey with her words that left me absolutely dazzled by her stage presence. I found her skill to be inspiring and significant for success, and I knew immediately that this was a person that I wanted to learn from. Rita, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Well, thank you for having me on, by the way. My background, I started off as a recruiter after a couple of different little stints once I finished college. And then I went on to working with data communications and telecommunications, but always kind of doing the recruiting thing in the background insofar as to helping people with interviewing and putting resumes together. And I would a lot of times work with people in terms of whatever their roadblock was and help them to move past the roadblock so that they could get to where it is that they want to go. And one of the roadblocks that I would see the most often would have to do with age, which to me was just always one of those things where it just would have my head shaking. It's like, how can that be your roadblock? Oh, my God. Because I I see it as the last thing in the world. In fact, I remember the first time that I faced ageism, it was on the other side of the corner. It's when I went to go interview for a fairly heady position at the Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles. And at the time, I was 19 years old. They hired me and everything. They, they were dazzled by me. They hired me. And then they said, let's see your driver's license. I gave them my driver's license. They said, oh, my God, you're only 19. And I said, yeah, so what? What's the problem? And they said, well, you're too young. You can't do this. I said, of course I can do this. You just told me I could do this. You just hired me. Of course I can do this. And I said, well, let's do this. How about if you guys try me for a month? And if you feel like I couldn't do it, then you fire me. No harm, no foul. But I'm telling you, I can do this and I will make you so proud. And they did. And I did. And it was all very good. And that was the first time that I dealt with ageism on the other side. And I dealt with it actually for a number of different times there where people would be flabbergasted that I was younger than I seemed. I haven't really dealt with it firsthand myself. Now on that, I feel like I'm on the older side, but I have a very a strong idea of how wrong it is. And I'll tell you why. My parents decided to retire when they were told to retire. They were told to retire when they were 65. And in retiring, basically, they changed practically overnight. I could see that it had to do with their not being involved in life and what's going on. and passing on their wisdom and basically finding more new things to share with people. And I would kind of prod them along to get them to do it. But because I was their child, they didn't think they should listen to me. And long story, very unfortunately, they both ended up dying. What I feel was just way too young. They were way too young to die. And it's because their life didn't have that third act, which is how I look at it. I always look at it as act three. What are you doing with yourself? I saw the same thing happen with a neighbor who was elderly, who had a phenomenal story to tell in terms of how he was instrumental in finding the polio vaccine. And and I, I would beg him to go share his story with others because there were so many lessons within his story. And he felt nobody would want to listen to him because he was too old. Well, that was his roadblock. That was his idea. And unfortunately, he didn't. Shortly afterwards, after being completely retired, he suffered a massive stroke and he died. And you just knew that it had a lot to do with the fact that he was not living his life fully. 
You know, there's the saying from Marian Williamson, which is, here's how to know whether or not you you're done living. If you're still breathing, you're not done, you know, and your life's mission is still there for you. And you got to live it. You really have to live it. Even if you don't know what it is, even if it's something that you've never done before, if it's something that comes from your lips, there must be some validity to it. And the next job then is to say, how do I pursue it? So I know I've kind of like gone over all these different courses here and sharing this with you. But as you can see, I feel rather strongly about this. Well, it's an important topic. And being purpose-driven throughout life is an important topic. Now, how do you suggest people stay relevant in what we live in, which is a very youth-dominated culture? Well, see, the first thing I would suggest is look at things for what they are. And so when we talk about a youth-dominated culture, who basically is saying that? Who's placing that label out there? And why should you necessarily buy into it? The fact of the matter is, is one of the things I've told my daughter over and over again, who is all into comedy, stand-up comedy, script writing comedy, et cetera. And I said, you know, if you really want to understand what the comedians do, find out who they learn from, all right? Go back. And, and I've taken her back to learning from comedians that were in the early 60s or even the 1930s or even silent age. The thing is, is that there's so much that you can learn if you don't put a label in front of you one way or the other. So if someone says, hey, well, we're really looking for somebody who basically may not have had as much experience as you've had, it's kind of like, well, what exactly is it that you're looking for? Because the fact of the matter is, is that don't let someone, their idea of who you are, don't let that person label you, walk away from it. And not only walk away from it, but make it your voice, make it your voice that you are not going to be determined to be too old for something or too whatever for anything. That's just not going to be the case. The other thing is listen to yourself very carefully in terms of what is it that is of interest to you. Share a brief story. When I was living in Washington in Seattle, I was around 35 and I was at the state fair in Seattle. I'd never been to a state fair before. I really didn't like them. That was my one time. And I thought, wow. These guys look mean and oh, I just don't like them. And as we were leaving, my husband, my kids and myself, as we were leaving, I could see something down the road. It was almost sunset, kind of moving around in a strange way. So I went to go investigate and it was a baby crawling around in a parking lot. So I picked up the baby. I couldn't believe that I found a baby in a parking lot at sunset. I picked up the baby. The baby was just so happy to see me. And I picked him up and of course I fell in love in one second. And and my first thing to my husband was, let's take him home. And my husband's kind of like, no, we call that kidnapping. You can't do that. You know, we have to figure out where the baby goes. (laughs) So I said, okay, I go walking around the parking lot, which is quite big. And finally I come around where there's these tents. And one of the tents that I walked up to the person there opened up the little tent curtain and she called the baby's name. And I looked at her and it was her baby. The baby obviously knew that was his mommy. The baby went to the mommy. And I mean, I started getting so mad at that woman. And I said, do you know your baby was so far away in the parking lot crawling? It could have been hit by a car. It could have been killed. And your baby's just wrong. What's the matter with you? And then I realized with the very last light of the day that on one side of her face, she had been pretty freshly beaten up. And that's why she wasn't there for her baby. And I realized that it's one of these carnies that I saw that looked so violent. You know, I mean, it just painted a terrible picture in my mind. And I looked at her and I said, so your life doesn't have to be this way. I said, how about if you and your baby come home with me? And we'll get you situated and we'll figure out what to do, but don't stay in this situation. And she was not going to listen to me. She wasn't going to have anything of it. She just wanted her baby and she just wanted me to go. 
So I went. The next day I came back because I was hoping to talk her into it again, but they were all gone. And this thing made me sick. I mean, I was heartsick over what I'd seen. I was upset with myself for yelling at that woman first, instead of first trying to figure out what her circumstances were. The whole thing was just a trip. And I thought about it for days and days and days. And then finally, I realized, you know, well, what can I do about it? Yes, there is something I can do about it. I could work with women and teach them how to be more powerful in work, how to find their own job, how to be more powerful, period. So I started looking for a job. Long story, very short, I found a job doing that, even though my husband told me he didn't want me to do it. And that's because I believe in not listening to my husband, by the way, which was a very good thing because, you know, otherwise I wouldn't have found this great thing to do. Then this is the thing that time and time again, I think about this woman. She lives in my mind's eye forever, so many years later. And the reason why is because she's the reason why we need to talk about topics like this, that you don't let other people define you, that you realize that even if you've retired, you're not done. You're really not done. There's something else that you can go on to doing. And the thing is, is that you may have something brand new to do. And how thrilling is that? I mean, the stimulation for your mind, for your body, that other people will learn from it is absolutely great too. For sure. And if you are really going to dare to use the word youth, youth should be the newness of what you've learned. It should not be about your age. So you take that newness of what you've learned and now you pass it on and and you probably grow it even more because you'll meet with other people that have information to share with you as well. Yes. It isn't about age. It's about our strengths. It's about where we grow. It's about what we have to offer. And and it doesn't matter if you're age 19 or you're age 65. It matters what you have to offer and what you have to bring to the table. Exactly. So what do you feel has been a big contributor to your own success? Well, for one thing, I don't let people label me. People can get on my nerves sometimes, and people will definitely try to label me for whatever reason. I am half Indian and half French, so I grew up not fitting in anywhere. I was not light enough or dark enough to fit in with anyone, and that was hard for a very long time. Plus, we never ate normal food, you know, like normal food back when I was a kid was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on Weber's bread. When I was a kid, you know, normal food, like a boiled egg or maybe some uh, French tuna or maybe a samosa. I mean, it would be these different things that people never saw. They, They would look at me like I was weird. And not only that, but everybody had those really cool lunch bales, like with peanuts characters and everything on it. My family didn't believe in that. Basically, it was just paper bags, you know, so how ordinary. The classic paper bag. Yes. <laughs> I know, I can find them everywhere. The thing is, is the good side of that is that it made me say, okay, so I'm not going to let people label me. Even when it's difficult, I won't let them label me. Like when I was in the seventh grade, I was sent to a private school because there was a lot of violence in the school that was nearby where I lived. And when I went to that private school, I really clearly didn't fit in initially. But instead of letting that ruin me, I remember it. I was telling my daughter this the other day. I said, I thought to myself, okay, these people clearly don't like me. And that's okay, because I need to figure out how I'm going to rule the school. And I figured out by the time when I was in the seventh grade, by the time I was in the eighth grade, I figured out the path that I would lead so that I would have the two roles that I wanted most in high school, which is student body president and student body activity chairman. And I got both of those roles. The fact of the matter is, is I was telling this to my daughter because you can't live in that space of I'm not succeeding or it's not working out for me. You have to live in that space of, okay, it's not working right now but what are the steps that I can take to make it work? And you have to be really clear on that. I mean, the the number one path to success, I would have to say, is your clarity of vision to what it is that you do want, making that happen. And don't let anything stand in your way. Yes, how can you get to where you want to be 
if you don't know where you want to go. Exactly. I think that's great. So basically figure out where it is you want to be and then find out what the steps are needed to get you there and then actually take the action to take those steps. That's exactly right. And be really honest with yourself. I think probably being honest with ourselves is probably the most important thing. It's the most important thing because we're quick. Human beings, I think, are generally quick to blame others for something that doesn't go right. But the reality of it is, is that if we really just look at ourselves square in the eye, we know that we have some ownership there. And we need to take our own ownership in order to move above and beyond whatever it is that's going on. And this has been a a great thing for me to realize and share with my children, because it's easy, I think, a lot of times to say, well, he wouldn't let me or she wouldn't let me. It's like, yeah, well, then fine. Just don't even bother with that person any longer. Find somebody else to work with. You'll get it done. It goes back to that victim mindset. Don't be the victim. Change your course. Yeah, it's so simple. I mean, really, if you just think of it, you want to go from being a victim to being a victor. That's really what it comes down to. And I do think of it in those opposite terms like that. Some people sometimes, I remember, I was almost going to do a speech about this, actually, have said, oh, she's such a Pollyanna. No, you know what? And if that is what a Pollyanna is, then I'll gladly take it. Because the reality of it is, is that I'm not going to let things stop me from getting to where I want to go. Should you let anything stop you? Should you? Should there be something out there that you say, oh, okay, I won't do it because this person right here said that I can't do it. All right. Don't let that happen to you. I think that's the big theme through what you're saying, that you need to believe in yourself. You don't let other people define you. You don't let other people stop you. You identify what it is that you want and you go get it. Exactly. I think that's really important because I think we do allow people to define us much too often. And that happens at all different ages. You know, ageism is something that happens at different times in our life. And and so often, whether we're the 19-year-old or the middle-aged, you know, 35 or, you know, the 50-year-old, we're dealing with different aspects of ageism. And, and it all boils down to other people's opinions of ourselves based on their perception of where we are in our, our stage of life, which really has very little to do with our ability to go out there and be successful. That's right. So now, is there anything that you're currently working on that you're excited about, Rita? Well, we're talking about this Act 3 thing. There's a couple of different things that I've been working on. I started working on a book for Act 3, which is a get out of your own way and get to where you want to go and consider that you've got a lot ahead of you. Because I think that people are so gifted and they have a gift to offer people. And the only time that you are really blowing your own gift is when you're not sharing it. So I really want that to be the thing that will encourage people to see that it's not as hard as they think it it could be, that it's actually easier than they realize. So that's one thing. I'm doing more talks about it now where uh, I talk to people about different examples that I've seen or read or dealt with and how these people have done phenomenal things. Because I feel like if you're going to pay attention to something right now, why wouldn't you want to pay attention to that which you wish to be rather than that that you don't want to be? It's like, I don't know about you, but like right now, you know, we've got this thing where we're stuck in our houses, the pandemic. And I will not have one little bit of anything to do with watching movies about zombies or pandemics or (laughs) viruses, any of that nonsense. And actually, even before this fell on us, I was feeling like, you know, we're bringing a lot of bad mojo into the air with this stuff. What's going on here? And I, I won't do it. And So my husband and my daughter, they love to do it. And so I just kind of sneak off. And I do something that will feed my mind in a better way. A lot of times it's reading a book or a portion of a book, or it might be listening to a TED Talk that talks about that sort of thing. In fact, actually, speaking of TED Talks, I am also looking forward to putting together a TEDx talk somewhere in San Jose that is going to, even though you cannot put a theme to a TED Talk, 
one thing that it will talk about is overcoming obstacles. And I think that this is a universal truth that people can take with them in any which way that they want to. One of the things that I think is uh, important to do is to put into your mind what it is that you want to get out there. So those are the things that I've been thinking about quite a bit. And one thing that I'll do too, it was looking like for a while there, thankfully it's not the case, but for a while there, it looked like I was having a significant physical setback. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, this is going to be really bad for me. What am I going to do here? And I'm looking around, I'm sitting in my office. I had not even unpacked my office at this point. We moved not that long ago. And I'm sitting in my office looking around. And I thought to myself, well, if I can't get out there and do speaking, then it'll just all be about writing. But I'm not going to have my voice suppressed because I think that that's one of the things that I bring to the table that is helpful for others is just kind of offering some advice or sharing some information that someone can grasp onto and put in their pocket and use to get to where they want to go. Yes. I love it. What's one piece of advice that you would give the audience or suggest to the audience? What would that be? Separate what's the truth from what is a perception. That would be the number one thing. Don't think that just because somebody says to you, well, shouldn't you be ready for retirement, that you listen to that as a truth. That's just a perception. Separate basically the labelers. I avoid people that label me. If they want to label me, they can do so, but I don't need to really listen to it. I don't need to be a part of it. I mentioned to you earlier about my being half French and half Indian. When people want to label me because of any of a number of things, I, I'm not the particular religion that they would want me to be. I'm not any particular religion that they would want me to be. I don't let that be something that is a problem. I just basically, I feel that it gives me more of a balanced way of looking at things because I'm not biased in any particular way. So think about that. And the number one question that I had on my wall in my office for a number of years is, what would you do if failure was not an app option? And I think that that's the big one. So that every time you say, This is what I want to accomplish. What would you do if failure was not an option? You go for it. You make it happen. And you say, failure is not an option. I'm I'm not going to allow it to be an option. It removes the fear. That's what it does. You remove, what if I were to not fear this failure? What would I do? And then you do it. Yeah. And in fact, those are two great opposites to think about all the time. One is fear and where it puts you. And the other one is faith. And when you're talking about faith, it doesn't need to be this thing where you say, oh, are we talking about, I hate to bring it up again and make it sound negative because that's not my intention, but it's not about religion. Faith is about trusting in yourself. Faith is about knowing that I would not have this idea in my head unless I was supposed to do something with this idea in my head. And you do something with it rather than being in fear of saying, oh, I I can't do it. Why not? Why not you? Why could it be somebody else? Why not you? Yes. And when you have faith, there is no more room for the fear. That's where you need to go. You know, is there anything that you've failed at, Rita, that you've learned massively from? That's so funny. You know, I remember one time my dad and I were having a massive fight. Massive. It's just huge. And this was before he he had had a minor stroke. After I had a stroke, I never would fight with him anymore. But he and I disagree on everything politically (laughs) and uh, on everything. And one day we were talking about something and I was talking about how women are making advances in industries where they're not thought of as making advances. And my example was this woman who is a savant who came up with a much more gentle way of euthanizing cows for the meat eating, ranching industry. And I explained that what she did was she came up with this thing where these cows are gently taking up a conveyor belt and there's pictures of the pastures all around and everything. And then they get to a certain point and yeah. 
And my father, um, my father said, well, how do you know that the cow didn't feel anything or didn't know? And I said, well, apparently they know because there's not a lot of bruised meat. That's how they can tell if they've struggled or if anything went wrong. And, and she has a very low percentage of bruised meat. At any rate, though, he said, you don't know that to be true. He said, what about you? He said, you've had failures in your life. You've had lots of failures in your life. And I looked at him and I said, and I bet you know every single one of them too. And the, the thing is, I said, so you look at them, you say you've had all these failures in your life. And I said, but let me tell you something. I don't look at them as failures. I look at them as learning opportunities. And I've taken every single one of them and done something with them. I said, otherwise I could not be where I am now doing the things that I'm doing now if I looked at myself as being a failure rather than being a good learner. And that's what I am as a good learner. So I would say the same thing to anybody else. I'd like to call failure ladder rungs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There you go. And I think that that's the thing, you know, I mean, so to me, that's how I've been looking at it for a long time. I since, of course, as you probably have, have seen many a famous person say the same thing, that they look at failures as learning opportunities. And the reality of it is, is that it really is just where there's not one person who has been an incredible success in their life that if they had looked at what they were doing as failure would be where they are today because they would say, oh, I failed at it. I give up. I'll walk away. I'll do something else. But it's the person that says it's not a failure. I need to learn from it and I need to figure out how to move forward. That's what you need to do. Now, maybe you need to get a help, some help from somebody. Maybe you need to find a mentor who can take you by the hand and listen to what you have to say for something that did not go the way you wanted it to and can offer you some perspective on how maybe you could do it differently the next time. But a mentor should be someone to you that encourages you to go forward with what your dreams are. It should never be someone who wants to be your wet blanket. Wow. There were so many great points Rita had to share with us today. I personally found at least five key takeaways from the conversation that I feel are so important to remember. The first, youth is about the newness of what you learn. I love this. And you can see it clearly in the people who embody this in life. People who are constantly learning and getting involved in new things. They have this vivaciousness, a a youthness to their energy that can't be denied. You know, my father was a high school teacher until the age of 65, and his students could never tell how old he was. They were shocked when they found out he was retiring, and it's because he was always learning something new. Second, that it's not about age. It's about our strengths and what you have to offer and what you have to bring to the table at every stage of the game. Let's remember that and not judge. Third, a reminder that it's okay if it's not working right now. Take a step back. Decide what it is that you want figure out the steps you can take to make it work, and then most importantly, execute on that plan. It is the winning formula to reach your goals. Fourth, always separate truth from perception. So important. It makes me think of this quote I have on my wall by Victoria Woodhill. I should not change my course because those who assume to be better than I desire it. Just because someone has a certain perception does not mean that it is the truth. Always ferret out the truth. Fifth, so important. Separate the labelers. Avoid those who label you. You don't have to listen to it or be a part of it. That is a problem with their own psyche. And we'll leave it at that. Don't let them in. I'll leave you with Rita's final parting words to me, which I found so powerful. Whoever you are and whatever your dream is, you have complete permission to go after it. So go on after it. Thanks again. Thank you for spending time with us on Fresh Blood. If you love this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, or giving us a review. I'm looking forward to connecting with you again on the next episode.